When most people think of Revelation, they think of dragons, and they think of Armageddon, and they think of end times, and millenniums, and all these sorts of things, but they don't realize maybe, or forget at times, that the first three chapters are some letters, very personal letters from Jesus to the earliest Christians. We think Revelation was written somewhere maybe 60 to 90 AD. So Jesus, you know, around 30 AD is his ministry. So around 35 AD is his death and resurrection. So this is our time frame. You know, we're in 20, almost 20 now. And we're looking back quite a ways. And you might think that people who are Christians back that far would have no trouble sticking to what they heard no trouble. Like Jesus was just like just here. It's like the age of our grandparents, you know, Jesus and then parents. and the, But they were getting off track already in so many of the same exact ways that we can get off track that I like looking at these letters to remind myself and to remind all of us, this is just what people do. It doesn't matter if we're 2,000 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection or whether they were 30 years after it. People are people, and sometimes we take a little detour. Sometimes we get off track. We know what we want to do, but then we find ourselves doing or saying or thinking other things, or we were like well-intentioned, but then get off base. And so Jesus is watching this, He's watching his church, his very first Christians kind of gather and meet and worship and meet needs of people, you know, provide food for widows and orphans. He's like seeing the gospel go out, and he's happy, but he's also wanting to make sure that he gives caution where caution is due so that things don't get off track all the way. And so he comes to John in this book of Revelation in a vision. And he says, write down everything that you see. And so he says, first, I want to give you seven letters to seven churches. And each of these seven churches had unique kind of personalities, unique troubles, unique obstacles. And so there's seven different lessons, seven different points that we can take to heart because we're just people like they were people. We're trying to follow Jesus like they were trying to follow Jesus. And they might have spoken Greek, and they might have lived and dressed long ago and much differently, uh, but people are people are people, and Jesus is Jesus, always. God is God, yesterday, today, and forever. And so what we started last week was to go through the seven letters, and we got through four of them. So if we want to review for those that might not have been here or just to kind of bring us back into that moment, the first letter that Jesus gives to John. And the letter is it's only a couple paragraphs. So they're not lengthy. They're just one thought. Just keep this in mind. You're my church. It's like, be a true church. Don't get off track. First one was to Ephesus. And the way we tried to remember that group of people is they were loyal but loveless. This happens in church sometimes. We're trying to do the right thing. We talked about taking ourselves too seriously before. Like we're trying to do the right thing. Are you following the rules? You did the wrong thing. Let's hold each other accountable. Let's like... What about the fact that the Bible says, quote, <laughs> joy of the Holy Spirit? The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but joy in the Holy Spirit. Where's your joy? Where's the fun in it? To know that you've been made by a God that loves you. He's got great plans for you, and there's a purpose, and you cannot fail if we stick close to him. Like, it's good news. The gospel is good news. Uh, we kind of treat it as, like, somber news or serious news too often. So, okay, let's learn from Ephesus. Let's be loyal, but let's be willing to just enjoy our lives together with God, with his spirit. And not, If we get the love, if we forget the love, then we've missed the whole point. The whole point is the love. So that was Ephesus. Then Smyrna. Uh, these are the people who are faithful but fearful. If you remember that phrase we used to try to lock in what that letter was all about, and this can be us too. What am I going to do about the bills, like uh, Sally was saying? But what about the bills and the money that's not there? What about this health scare that I'm waiting on results from a test? What about the entrance into college? What about paying for college? What about my marriage that's on the rocks? What about my children that are going their own direction, and I want to kind of show them what I can see that they can't yet, yeah, like fear. What if the Bible isn't true? What if God isn't there? What if, what if the fears, they come in? And so Jesus said, I've got you. You're trying to be faithful, but you're just too afraid. Give me more trust. Rest in me a little bit more. I've got you. And so it's a reassuring letter to a group of people that were starting to get off track by being too afraid, where God's people were not supposed to be afraid. The greater the faith, the less the fear. So that's the second one. The third one is Pergamum. Uh, these people were Christians, but conforming. Remember we talked about that? Like they stood for Christ. He says, I know where you live, <laughs> meaning like I know the city you're in. I think he calls it the synagogue of Satan. I know where you live. It's like a bad place. Either the city you live in is a bad city, 
you stand up for me. You call yourself a Christian. Like, that's great. And we're all in jobs and friend circles where our friends know we're a Christian and they're not. And that's a good thing, but he pointed out to them that they were just doing all the same things that their friends were doing. They were conforming. So in the end, then what's the difference? So you call yourself a Christian, but you do the same exact things. You party the same way. You do the same things. Like you talk the same. Like if you're the exact same, then are you Christians? And so we challenge them. Don't just fit in and do what everybody's doing because you're losing your testimony. That can be us so easily. We just do what everybody's doing, and then at some point we have to step back. And like, what do I stand for? What difference am I making in this world? All right, and then uh, Thyatira was the last one for last week. And these were the people that were really devoted, but they had taken on some teachings of a person he calls Jezebel. That's sort of a figurative name, so I don't believe she was actually named Jezebel, but some sort of prophetess who said she was speaking for God, but she wasn't. She was encouraging people into all sorts of sexual immorality and all sorts of crazy things, saying, God told me to tell you to do this. And people were getting off track. So they were devoted, but they were deceived. And so the caution that we got from that is just be careful who you're listening to. Careful what books you're reading. Careful what podcasts you listen to. Not careful like, oh, I better stay away from all of it, but just match everything you hear and see to the Bible because you can trust the Bible, but we can't always trust people. And sometimes you can trust people for like a little while and then they go off track. So like you could trust what they said before this date, but then when they went crazy, you can't trust anything they say after this date. So I was like, can I recommend the book from that person before this person went way off track? Because that was a good book, but now he's not so, like, you know that weird thing we have to do because people change and people fail? Oh, I love that pastor and his preaching. And then there's this huge scandal with money or an infidelity or something like, well, I don't ever want to watch any more of those sermons anymore because I know where he ended up. But you're like, but it was really good before that, and it was really, pre like, it just gets weird. The Bible doesn't get weird. It's filled with a lot of weird people, but it stays steady, and it's consistent. You can trust it, so just match everything. Compare it. You've got your podcast, and you've got your Bible. You've got your Sunday morning preacher, and you've got your Bible. You've got the thoughts in your own head. What about this? And you've got the, everything to the Bible, everything to the Bible. And it doesn't matter if the name is Billy Graham or anyone in between. Match it to the Bible, and that's what Jesus says to that church. You're devoted, but you are actually being tricked. I'm not speaking to that person. They don't speak for me. So that brings us up to speed. We have the last three. I'm looking at my clock and my time. Well, it's good that today's the week for three. I don't think I'd have time for four. But I'd like to read them. I'd like to give you a way to remember them. We're going to go one, two, three. That'll finish off these seven letters. And as we did last time, would you please listen for how it might be a parallel to us, specifically New Hope, but also you and myself, because we're supposed to learn from the Bible. We're supposed to learn these lessons so we don't have to repeat all the same stupid mistakes over and over and over. So we're trying to learn here from people who have walked before us. All right, so chapter 3, Revelation 3.1, <clears throat> is to a church in Sardis. The way that I want us to remember this church is that they're flattered by everybody, but they're fake. Everybody talks highly about this church. Oh, have you been to that church? Have you heard their music? Have you seen their lights? Have you heard their pastor? Have you seen the play? But it's fake. They're very flattered. They've got a reputation, but it's not actually substance. It's all, you know, people. It's not from Jesus. And so he challenges them, like we sang this morning, wake up. Because you think you're doing all sorts of things, but I know that actually you need to come alive. So these are the flattered but fake churches, and we don't want to be of this. So let's learn. So Jesus says to John in his vision what to write. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these are the words of him, Jesus, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Jesus says, I know your works. I know you. I see you. He says, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. So wake up and strengthen whatever remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard and keep it. And repent means turn around, like turn back. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled the garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So to the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, 
I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I know we have a shorter amount of time, but there's a few things in here that could be sermons in and of themselves. Recognize, he says, you're dead, but wake up. Usually you're asleep and then you wake up. You're dead and you decompose, right? That's what comes one after the other. You're dead and you rot, or you're asleep and you wake up. He says, you're dead, wake up. It's a very interesting point. I can't highlight this enough. I hope to intrigue you to look into it more on your own. Death is not the end in God's perspective. So when you're dead, it's not over. You're dead, we can still wake up. This is a, a statement of resurrection, but it's also a concept. One of the things that's spoken as a critique about the Bible uh, in terms of the afterlife is that the Jewish people had a different concept of heaven and hell, Sheol, um, called Abraham's bosom, than the New Testament did. And so they sort of point and say, well, then how is it consistent over time if they describe it in different ways? This is one of those great words to say, no, it's exactly the same. Because if you go all the way back to Genesis, You'll hear it said things like, Abraham slept and was buried with his fathers. So the Jewish tradition, the Jewish understanding, the, the beginning as God's sort of like revealing more and more progressive revelation over time, starts with the concept that death is sleep. Death is not death. And there's, I don't know, 7, 9, 11 people through the Old and New Testament, there are stories of people coming back to life. It's not just Jesus' story. That's a testimony that's repeated many times over time, both in the Hebrew and then in Christ and the New Covenant. Like it's, it's this consistent message. I love the fact that it's saying when you're asleep, when you're dead, there's still waking up possible. How encouraging is this if our marriage is dead? Like literally flatlined. It could wake up. Never too late. Even dead isn't too late. This is an encouraging concept I would just like to challenge you to really own. What about addiction? I'm dead to my addiction. There's no coming back from that. Well, you could be dead. So let's wake up. It's not like it's dead so it's too late. It's dead so now this is where only God can step in, but he can and he does. So wake up. He points out certain people in this church. There's like little spots that are still alive. A person in the midst of a dead church, in the midst of a church that's all about the show. It's all fake. And he's like, I'm, I see you. So individuals are there hanging on to the truth. But as a whole, you're kind of losing your way. Don't be fake. Hang in there. And even if the whole church is dying, and even if the whole church is dead, that's not too late for that church either. It's never too late. Death is sleep. Sleep is death. They're just synonyms, and it's a good way for us to think about our death. It's a good way to think about the whole Bible that talks about sleeping with the fathers, you know, falling asleep, coming to Christ in resurrection. It's all, like, it's all tied together. So the second thing I'll say about this before we move on to the middle one, uh, which really is the shortest, so that'll, that'll help us out with our time this morning, is just think about what it takes to wake someone up in the morning. All right, let's just make it really like, practical. This morning, this is like a hard thing for some people. I'm not going to mention any names in my family, any women that are sitting down in the second row. I'm not going to mention any names, but sometimes it's really hard to wake up. So what does it take? It might take the smell of coffee brewing. It might take an alarm. It might take screaming kids. It, you know, what wakes us up? All of those things have spiritual parallels. And again, if you're willing to take this this week as my handoff to you to think and pray more about it, what is it going to take to wake you up? Sometimes we wake up because we're rested. It's just time. Like enough time has passed, we're ready. It's just us. But other times, something has to go wrong. Warning, 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 warning. Five minutes before we've got to leave. Warning, warning, warning. Sometimes we get into a car accident. It's like, I could have died right then. Warning, warning. What am I doing with my life? Alarms. Sometimes these alarms go off in our lives spiritually as well. When that happens, just wake up. Just get out of bed. Sometimes it's other people. Sometimes it's kids jumping on you. Sometimes it's a spouse giving you the elbow. Get out of bed. Go walk the dog. Whatever. It's time to get up. We need friends. Who are your friends that love you enough to be like, you're sleeping on your faith? You're just, you haven't gotten out of bed to do a thing in your faith in a year. Got to know each other to know that. Got to love each other to be willing to say that, even if we risk the friendship. But how good to then wake up and get out of bed and get something done. 
live a little. Right? So be thinking about the wake up. It's, it's normal to sleep. We all fall asleep. Who's going to be the person to wake you up? What's going to be the situation, the tragedy even possibly, that will wake you up? Or maybe you're just ready. Maybe you're just rested. Enough laying down already. But just go do something. I'm tired of sitting. Bored. Let's go serve the Lord. Let's go be active. This life that I'm creating is just boring. Can we live a little? Can we get up? This is the wake up, right? Wake up. And it doesn't matter if you're all the way dead. Still just wake up. And whether it comes through an alarm, whether it comes through just the passing of time, fullness of time, or a friend, embrace the wake up. Embrace the morning. To the church in Philadelphia, these people are patient, and God says, Jesus says to them, I promise it's going to work out. It's just simple. They're the patient and the promised. They've just got an open door. He says, it's waiting. It's going to be fine. You're not going to suffer the way that you think you are. Just walk through the door. I got it paved. It's going to work. Just keep going. So this is a very encouraging letter. Of all of them, this is the one that has the least sort of challenge. It's the most just encouragement from Jesus to this church. But it is a a warning. So like, stay where you're going. Be patient. Keep on track because I've got you. So let's hear his letter to this church, Church in Philadelphia. John writes from Jesus, verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one opens. He says, I know your works. He says, I see you. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. So kind of like insignificant, powerless people. And yet you've kept my word and you haven't denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon, so hold fast to what you have so no one may seize your crown. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is like people that are just like small in the eyes of the world and maybe even literally. Maybe they're poor financially. Maybe they're insignificant, have no influence in their city. But they just are bearing the name of Jesus well. And he says, I put an open door in front of you that no one can stop. I would like to believe that this is Jesus' promise to us too. As we've gone through this last year, a couple of years of exploring what doors God is opening for us, I do believe that he's just holding them open. And it's an exciting time to be in this church. I want us to be the church that's patient for what God has promised. To not give up on each other, not give up on him. And to not worry that doors are going to slam shut. But he's got his foot like lodged in the door. It's just open. We just have to keep walking forward. And that he will bring those promises to fruition We are in a blessed time in the life of our church and of all these letters, the one that I see and pray will be us, will be this one, the church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love, right? Greek words, brotherly love. If we operate this way, then these words will hold true for us. Just be patient because God's got us. So that's the most unabashedly positive letter and then we end with the most unabashedly (coughs) negative letter. This is to the church in Laodicea, and these people are comfortable and useless. That's how you need to remember this letter. They are comfortable and useless, meaning they're of no use to themselves, they're of no use to the world, they're of no use to anyone. They literally just think they've got it all figured out, think they've got everything they need, and they don't realize that they're not amounting to anything. And the stuff they have is just, you know, temporary stuff that's going to blow away. The things that they value don't have value. And so when he writes to them, he says, I wish, I wish you were something other than useless. Be hot, be cold, be something. Stand for something. Don't just sit on the fence. Don't be useless. So that's this letter. Comfortable people, and we are comfortable people. This is a great letter to the church in America. where We're the richest people in the world. Uh, and don't think that we need a thing. We actually talked about this at youth group a little bit this past week. It was a good conversation. Like we, it's 
hard sometimes to have faith when you don't need faith because you got money and friends and education and opportunity. It's hard to see God when you don't need to look for him. You know, if you're injured, you just go to the hospital. You don't sit down and pray for healing. It's just, it's weird when you have too much. It's actually a block sometimes to our faith. And so this church really was struggling with that. So this letter could be a good letter to our country, and it's what we're going to finish up with, with all these seven letters. It's where Jesus finishes up. So seventh letter, to the church in Laodicea. So to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and either hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. But you don't realize that actually you're wretched. You're pitied, pitiable. You're poor. You're blind. You can't see. You're naked. You're not covered. I counsel you, Jesus says. This is my advice. Buy from me the kind of gold that's refined by fire so that you actually might be rich. And white garments so you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So I love you enough to tell you this hard thing, Jesus says. So be zealous. Like have some energy. Have some passion. Have some zeal. And turn around. Go back the way you're supposed to. Repent. Metanoia means turn back. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. So he's like banging on the door and he knows they're in there and he knows they're his people, but they're just useless. They're not doing anything. He's saying, wake up, have some passion, have some zeal. I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice, he who has ears, let him hear. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, I will eat with him. He with me, that proximity, that love, that feeling we get that we're just close to Jesus and he's got us. He says, that's what's gonna happen. Verse 21, so the one who conquers... I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's two ways to take verse 15. So can I throw them both out there for you to consider how you might apply it to yourself? Cold and hot. One way to look at that, Jesus wishes they were cold or hot, is that cold water has good function. You know, on a hot day, you want a cold glass of water. Cold is refreshing. Cold is purifying. Cold is what you want at certain times. But hot water also has its purpose for cooking, for cleaning. And so Jesus could be saying with the cold and hot kind of contrast, I wish you were good for something. Can you be good for someone giving someone a cold, refreshing drink? Can you be good for cooking something or cleaning something? Lukewarm, nobody wants to drink you, and you can't cook anything with you. You're useless. Would you be something? Would you stand for something? So if we look at that in terms of our own lives, what do you stand for? Do you stand for truth, say? And so in your job, when unethical things are happening, you're the one that says, I don't think we should do it that way. So you stand for something. Are you the one that's the compassionate hugger, the one who gives the best hugs? Ellen, you're great at giving hugs. So are you the warm water there when someone feels that embrace? You bring that to the table. So wherever you are, you bring warmth. But if you were to just sit and watch people, then you're not warm. And if that person who knows what's better and doesn't speak up, then they're Luke. You're nothing. So you can look at it that way. The other way to look at it is hot or cold in terms of your faith. Either you're on fire for your faith or you're just like dismissing it. You're just nothing. You're you're, you're in or you're out kind of thing. And if you look at it this way, Jesus could be saying, I wish you would commit one way or the other, but just stop standing in the middle. Are you for me or are you against me? I'd actually rather that you be honest about it. And if you don't believe in me, say so. Then say that you do believe in me and live a different way and so make me look bad to the entire world. I would rather you said you hate me then love me and act like you hate me. But if you love me, why don't you act like it? Let's have the romance and the passion that we had at the beginning, your first love, like we go back to our love list letter back there in Ephesians. So if that's the way you want to take the metaphor, it's not described. It's two different ways to look at the same sentence. Either could have been Jesus' intention. Those letter recipients knew it was to them. It struck a chord, they heard the words, and they understood. Yeah, come on in, kids. But for us, Just hear what Jesus is saying to us. He's saying, be useful. Whatever your gifts are, use them with passion. And if he's saying, be hot in your faith, be zealous, then be on fire. And if you're not sure what you believe, then say that. We can at least be honest with each other. 
And so if we're cold in our faith, then I challenge you to tell someone, I'm kind of cold in my faith right now. God already knows it. If it's true, then it's true. But that's the honesty that Jesus can work with to take us from there, even if it's a dead, cold heart, that's still just a wake-up moment, right? Death is still just a wake-up away from being alive. So this church in Laodicea is where we end. It's where we bring together all these letters. It's our challenge to our church. Will we be genuine instead of being fake? Will we be patient, even if it takes time to get to the open doors? Will we be useful for the kingdom? Will we live for Jesus, or will we just sort of bide our time and wait and be too comfortable thinking that we've got everything we need? Those are Jesus' challenges to his church, his people he loves. He's not trying to get rid of any of these people. He's trying to woo them back to him. All these letters are to people he loves and people who love him who just got off track a little bit. So let's leave this as our challenge to ourselves. I encourage you, please keep digging into these first few chapters of Revelation. Hear what it is that the Spirit is saying to our church that we can stay on track, follow him where he's taking us and not slip into some of the same patterns that these same people who love Jesus just like we did slipped into all those years ago. Amen. Let me call the music team forward. Let me say a word of prayer. We're going to close with a song and uh, let these kids who've rejoined us join us in singing our way uh, into whatever God has for us today and this week. Jesus, we know that you can see us, and so we start with just a statement of openness. See us as we are, for better and for worse, and we state your grace as sufficient, as all sufficient. Please continue to do your work in our body of Christ, in this group of people. May we hear what it is that you're saying to us, and may we be zealous and excited to pursue you with joy with love into the days ahead. Jesus, I would ask for your help in this. I would ask for your wisdom in this, and I'd pray for your spirit to just settle upon each man, woman, and child, each one of us in this room, that we may go out into our cities and towns and homes and families to be ambassadors for you this week again. Pray we give you a good name this week, Jesus, and that you would be the one that help us do it. And it's in your name we pray.